This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time. Content presented in the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the host and guest and may not represent the views and opinions of the Whole Care Network. Always consult with your physician for any medical advice and always consult with your attorney for any legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. Healthcare providers assume the goal is to do everything possible to get as better as possible, let's say. And oftentimes what I found early on was that the goal actually was just to reduce suffering and all along. And the natural decision making that our society says is to reduce suffering is to fight death. When in reality, sometimes it's embracing death and, and choosing comfort. This is the Heart of Hospice podcast with Helen Bauer. Today I'm talking with hospice physician and educator, Dr. Lauren Templeton. Whether you're a family caregiver or an end-of-life professional, the Heart of Hospice is here to enhance your hospice experience by connecting you with information you can use about end-of-life care. Our guest today is unique. Yes, she's a hospice doctor and we've had hospice doctors on before, but I've actually met her in person several times, which is unusual. Most of my guests, I've had them on two or three times, known them for almost 10 years and never met them in person. But Dr. Lauren Templeton runs in the same circles I do because we both live in the state of Texas. She is a fellowship trained board certified hospice and palliative medicine physician. She has an additional certification from the hospice medical director certification board, and she's a fellow of the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. She has great credentials. What you're going to find is she also has great heart. She is passionate about hospice education for hospice physicians. And she serves as a medical director for a nonprofit hospice organization out in West Texas. She's got an interesting story. She never saw herself as a hospice medical director. She initially started out thinking that she would be a surgeon. She liked the trauma surgeon stuff and then did the routine surgeon stuff, and eh, not so happy with that, thought it was sort of boring. But she got comfortable having hard conversations with patients and families. And her co-workers noticed it. They called her the DNR queen, the do not resuscitate queen, because she was really good at pausing and helping people to align the interventions with the goals that they had for their loved one or for themselves. She's going to share her greatest wish for the hospice industry. That's always one of my favorite questions to hear what people have on their wish list. And she's also going to be talking about her newest self-care habit, because we don't talk enough about self-care these days, but it's still really important. So here's my conversation with hospice physician, Dr. Lauren Templeton. Lauren, welcome to the Heart of Hospice podcast. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. I uh, can't believe I haven't joined you guys yet. This is a great day for me. I'm excited. I am excited to have you on the show. And unlike most of my guests, we have actually met in person several times, which is unusual. Yeah. We were just talking a little bit about the conference and how I just, it was amazing to reconnect with people in person. It's funny how virtual is the norm now and in person is this crazy exciting thing but alas life is different i know well you and i live across the entire state of texas from each other i'm in south which is the whole country yeah which is a whole country so we got a lot of distance so connecting with you at a conference is an awesome thing we get to to chat however briefly at a conference because we it we stay busy but 
We've got a good show today. We've got some interesting things we want to talk about. So I want to get started with your story and how you moved into doing hospice and palliative care work. How did you find a place in hospice work? So I love this question because I think it is a very just spiritually driven path for me. It was a lot of closed doors, actually. Um, and looking back, you could, I think I can say that the doors were open just in a different direction. But at the time, I felt like closed doors. So I uh, started out in college wanting to be a social worker and then really realizes that realized that I didn't have the patience for that, that I really like to be more in control of situations and felt like that would be not a skill set that you want to have as a social worker. <laughs> but I wanted to be in the healthcare system and I had a father, a sister, and a brother that were physicians. And so really medical school for me was like, uh, okay, well, there's nothing else that I, I want to do that I can see myself doing. Um, I actually quickly grabbed on to being a surgeon. And so my intern year, I was in a, an amazing general surgery program at a level one trauma center. And I did my first month as a physician in, in a trauma center in Columbus, Ohio, with gunshot wounds and gang violence and, and all the things. And I loved it, loved it. That next month, I went into general surgery and did hernias and gallbladders and thought, oh, I can't do this part of it. <laughs> like, I, I want to do the intensity of trauma care. So the, the routine stuff was boring? No, so boring. Absolutely. I could not. I, I just thought five years of hernias, gallbladders, appendix. I just can't. I can't see myself being successful um, and I was really just guided to internal medicine. I ended up doing a month of nights as an intern, which normally people hate, and I found myself loving it. And what I loved about it was that at night, things are a little bit different. People are a little more vulnerable with you. In the healthcare system, we know that stuff really goes down in the middle of the night. True. It's it's a crisis. Sometimes you're alone. You don't have your full support system. And I found myself having these very complex conversations in the middle of the night with families surrounding their, let's say, elderly mother that's 99 in the ICU. And I got a reputation as the DNR queen. And so I just was a person in the beginning that w was willing to have difficult conversations. And oftentimes in those crises, I was willing to talk about, well, what are our goals? Where, where do we want to go from here? And so a hospice nurse stopped me a year or two down the road and asked me if I would pick up some doctor call for a hospice. And I think most people want to hear that I said, oh, yeah, that's lovely. And this hospice nurse pulled me into the world of hospice. And it was such a great experience. I looked at her and said, no, I went to medical school to fix people and save people. So thank you, but no thank you. Yeah. But little did she know. That's what opened my eyes to, well, wait a minute. Actually, what I'm really passionate about are these hard conversations. This group of people do that as a profession. And they serve patients and families' goals, even in hard times. And so I just wanted to do, um, you know, a rotation. At that point, I was going to be a hospitalist and internist. And I did a rotation in hospice and palliative medicine. I called my brother, who's a surgeon also and said, hey, I really have some interest in hospice and palliative care. And he said, that's so funny. I just had dinner with a guy named Tommy Farrell last night. <laughs> and Tommy Farrell is, as some of you may not know, listening, the past president of the Hospice Medical Director Certification Board. And he was starting a brand new hospice and palliative care fellowship. And so I got connected with him, flew out to Lubbock, Texas. He bought me a Dr. Pepper because, you know, in Texas, people love their Dr. Pepper <laughs> and just changed my career. So, um, you know, fell in love with Tommy Farrell, which is all of hospice, palliative, having hard conversations, not afraid to challenge, um, not afraid to advocate, stick up. So I really had this the best mentorship possible in this complete career shift of mine. Um, and so then I did a year of hospice and palliative medicine at Texas Tech University as a fellow and 
still thought that hospice and palliative medicine for was for retiring doctors. Still, still thought that. <laughs> and then, um, was at hospitals for about six months, and that really was the final door closing of trying not to do hospice and palliative care. To say like this is really where my um, passion is. Just truly so passionate about advocating for patients and healthcare communities to both be successful together. Then I was offered a job as a hospice medical director, and that was about 10 years ago. So the rest is history. Totally not where you saw yourself going. And just multiple times where, you know, in the healthcare field, you get pigeonholed into what you're going to do because it's it's hard to change. And once you have a neurology skill set as a nurse, let's say, going over to the cardiology floor is challenging. Oh, yeah. And so it, it, it's you're really funneled into this path of once you're on it, the most common thing is to stay there. And I just was jumping off these paths left and right. So it was, you know, getting a little bit familiar with discomfort in my career in the beginning for several years before I settled into what I was going to do. And so now I look at that discomfort as, well, that must mean something great's coming. <laughs> you know, if, if we're uncomfortable, yeah, mm -hmm. it's a growing pain. And that means something really good is on the other side. It really is a big deal for physicians and people working in medical care in the nursing field to change a specialty because it's it's like learning another language. It really is. And then, and of course, you want to get good at it. And, and the longer you stay in it, the more comfortable you, f you feel in that space. Yeah, nurses, we're always looking for something better. We have a tendency to job hop. So my, my hospice story is very similar. And I think a lot of people saw themselves at the beginning of their careers, oh, I would never work with people who were dying. I, I want to do labor and delivery and kids and babies and, you know, sort of the, the happy stuff, the, the triumphant things. And then we end up working with those who are dying. And what we have found out is those are still the happy things. Those are still the, the, the triumphs that come. It's just at a different phase of life. Yeah, absolutely. I love that you use kind of the labor and delivery OB as the example, because in my experience, I've had a lot of OB nurses or specifically LND nurses come over into hospice care and they, they always make the best hospice nurses. Yeah. There's something very parallel about the labor of birth and the labor of death. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. Just being being able to be in a stressful moment and trying to make it good and beautiful. And it, I mean, it's still life and death in L&D. I mean, sure. even though we're so blessed in our country that the mortality rate is low, but it's very, very stressful. And there's multiple lives at stake. And that ability to tolerate that stress and navigate it uh, to make things more peaceful, to focus on the calm, to focus on the good. I think that skill set comes over into hospice. So mm -hmm. I always welcome an interview from an L&D nurse when they come to hospice, which people laugh about because it just seems so different, but it's quite similar. Yeah, I think there's a natural, natural transition from one to the other. So I want to touch back on something you said. You said that they called you the DNR queen when you worked at night. What did they mean by that exactly? So... I was known for pausing, even in a stressful situation, like requiring intubation or a central line because the patient was septic and, and needed resuscitation or um, medication to keep their blood pressure up to, to get everybody on board to make sure we were doing what aligned with what the end goal was. So stepping back to say, and, and this is still my focus, is aligning the intervention with a goal. And so oftentimes we as healthcare providers assume the goal is to do everything possible to get as better as possible, let's say. And oftentimes what I found early on was that the goal actually was just to reduce suffering and all along. And the natural decision making that our society says is to reduce suffering is to fight death. When in reality, sometimes it's embracing death. 
in, in choosing comfort. And so oftentimes, you know, we would go in and I would be getting the consent for intubation or putting them on uh, mechanical ventilation and come away from that conversation with a DNR order and that we're, we're not going to do that because mom wouldn't want this or grandma has had a great life and she's already in stage Alzheimer's disease. So why would we put her through this? It's just that no one stopped to align the goal to the intervention. We just assumed that everybody would want to avoid death at all cost. Right. And I think the key is pausing, like you, what you were saying. Take just a minute and be able to talk with people. And those conversations are hard. Those conversations are hard. I think they're hard for us as healthcare providers because we don't know how to do them very well. And then we're telling people stuff that they do not want to hear. And it, it makes for a very uncomfortable situation all the way around. Yeah, I really, I agree with that. I think also what empowers us is that we can look back as hospice providers and palliative care providers to say they didn't want to hear it in the moment. But after everything's said and done, it's exactly what they needed to hear. And so looking at things from that perspective and, and hearing those phrases from families of, oh, we wish we had known about this sooner, or we never would have had the heart path if we had known that it would have resulted in this. You know, we have all of that experience to say that even though this conversation is hard in the moment and it's what they don't want to hear, we also can get them to a place where it's what they need to resolve whatever grief, trauma, you know, get through the situation. Right. And, you know, that's how the podcast got started. Because after hearing that, those words come out of people's mouths so many times, I wish we had known about. Well, why don't they know about it? Because we don't take time. We're scared of the conversations or we haven't been provided with the training or we haven't gotten out and gotten the training that we need to have those conversations. Or as healthcare providers, we're unwilling to have them because it makes us uncomfortable. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. The discomfort that we're not willing to feel, I think, is where we choose the easier conversation, which is we can just put your mom on a ventilator and give her antibiotics and we'll hope for the best. I mean, that sounds right. and whatever happens, so appealing. It, yeah, it just happens. Yeah. I think we can do better than that. So being able to have those conversations sort of guided your career path. You had a gift for talking to people and having intentional conversations when you knew it needed to happen. And a lot of times in the, the heat of the moment and the pace of the moment, we don't take time to have those conversations. Healthcare providers don't because those decisions need to be made so quickly. I wonder sometimes if we don't want to have to wait for people to deliberate what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that it, well, oh, this is why we argue for earlier palliative care in, in the earlier discussion about hospice is because ideally we make all of our hard decisions in peace and calm. Right. But the ideal is not what we're faced with. And so I think there's room for two truths there that we really want to advocate for making some of these decisions outside of the stressful space and it's unfortunate that healthcare providers are constantly put in the situation where you're having to decide life or death in the life or death moment versus having advanced directives that say, if I'm terminal, I do or don't want this. I mean, that would be lovely for all of us. Um, it, it, and it, it is very hard to have to do all of this in the moment, in that stressful decision making where the outcome is weighed in seconds, minutes, hours of decision making. I think, though, that also is our discomfort to be in a rush. And, and in reality, if we take a pause to say, okay, I can get some of these things started, let's say resuscitation, for example, I can get some of these things in the works and going while I'm having these conversations is what we have as healthcare providers have to learn to do. And unfortunately, we get put into multitasking and if anyone hears me talk for long, I'm a, a proponent of multitasking should never be a thing. It's not a thing because you can't do two things at once well. <laughs> true, but true. that's why this is so hard is, is you're, you're watching the vital signs change through the window and you're asking the son to say goodbye to his mother. And, and it's just, it's hard. It's just hard. And, and I wish it wasn't something that we all had to do, but 
Also, if we're advocating for palliative care and earlier advanced directives and decision making, maybe we as healthcare providers will have to shoulder that decision making in the moment less. That's my hope. Well, and there are events where that moment to moment in the situation decision making has to happen, right? There Mm -hmm. are acute events and accidents and terrible things that happen. But if we start having those conversations earlier, more often, then we have created a space for people to consider things and to come back with questions and then to reconsider. Because I think we don't focus enough on the fact that those advanced care planning conversations are not a single conversation if it's done well. We have to come back, have those conversations again. Are these still your goals? I mean, so every time we admit somebody to hospice, we are asking them in that initial nursing assessment, how do you feel about resuscitation? How do you feel about going back to the hospital? And the reason we ask every single time is because their wishes and their goals for their health care and their quality of life may have changed. So it's, it's never a one and done. We just, we just like to think we could check the box and move forward because it would be so much easier. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, when I was in labor with my first son, it actually went a little bit south. I had been, um, I think at hour 27, 28, we went ahead for C-section and, and it, both of us were a little unstable, baby and mom. And as we're going into the OR for the C-section, I stop the nurse and my husband and say, pause. I have to tell you what I want if this is going to be really bad and it looks like it could be really bad. And they're both looking at me like, what are you talking about? And so I just spill out because there was no other moment. When right. when was this going to happen? And so I just spill out. I define quality of life as being able to get up and out with you and the kids. If it's not going to happen that way, you have my permission to not do anything else to keep me alive. If I can't be out and happy with you and our son, then whatever decision aligns with that, that's what you're going to have to do. And so my husband looks at me and goes, uh-uh. I cannot. (laughs) I look at the nurse and I go, you heard that. You will have to tell everybody, not my husband. So that's that's what we learned that now my sister is the one who makes those decisions for me. That's a great lesson, though. That is a great lesson. So your decision maker might not agree to do what you want them to do. And so they shouldn't be your decision maker. That's pretty hilarious. I love it. I love it. Now as a palliative care doctor, I love that he told me I'm not your person in that moment. You got somebody else. Yeah, that's crazy as hell. I'm not doing that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, yeah. that's funny that, and it's a little bit odd, I have to say, it, it had to be your your medical school training that you would stop as the patient in the middle of this situation and say, hey, we need to have this conversation really quickly on in my advanced care plan and end of life wishes. Yeah. That was the last thing on your labor and delivery team's mind. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But it, I think there was some also relief to the nurse, I'm sure. Well, I, I won't say I'm sure, but I don't think she's experienced that situation before. <laughs> Probably not. Um, but she got it, though. I mean, she knew what the, we, the reason we're urgency in a rush here is because there are lives at stake. And when there are lives at stake, awful things can happen. And, and she just looked back at, me, back at me and she said, okay, got it. Yeah. And let's go. And I was so proud of her. I mean, I remember being in labor in pain and looking at her and being like, I'm going to hire you later on to work for <laughs> hospice and palliative. You're going to make a great hospice and palliative care nurse. Yeah. Someday. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love it. I love it. So working in hospice, you, you said basically you had been guided towards this. Other doors closed and you realize this isn't what I like. This isn't what I like. Oh, I like hospice and palliative care. What do you find most captivating about people who are dealing with end of life issues? It's not easy work. What what do you find most compelling about it? I'll say maybe it's a little bit um, narcissist because it's about me. It, it's about uh, being in something so hard with someone and being able to navigate it to be easier, whatever that might be. And so that is what I love. I love to sit down in this conversation and just say, this is going to be sad or angry or all types of emotions. But my job and my skill set is 
to help that person navigate, let's say it's not the patient, it's their representative, navigate on behalf of their loved one with the ability to go on in their life and process their grief, uh, process their loss, and, and, and to be just a little bit better with that situation. And so that's really what I love about it, is helping people through a hard time in a manner that lets them be successful going forward. And I love it actually when kids are involved, which I know is is difficult to say, but I have had the most reward in my career with, you know, grandchildren or little children and sitting down with them and walking through what their grief looks like. You get the most beautiful stories. I mean, when you listen to kids talk about what they think heaven is, I've heard things from heaven is where you get to eat as many donuts as you want and play PlayStation all day <laughs> with grandpa. Yeah. Um, someone told me that heaven is a roller coaster. And then they paused and said, and it never stops. You just get to keep going. Oh, my gosh. Um, because they loved roller coasters. That doesn't sound roller coasters. That doesn't sound like heaven to me. That sounds, Not, so that sounds like the other direction to me. But yeah. <laughs> but the healing that you can bring people in the really hard moments, um, even if it's something that they recognize later on, I think that is my draw. And, and that is why I was the DNR queen is, is the desire to sit in difficult times with families or patients and help them to navigate something really hard, just a little bit easier. Yeah. So that's not really saying that we like it because that that's about us. It's that we get to be part of something so important for somebody else. It feels good to be, to bring value yeah. to somebody's journey like that. There's a lot of reward and a lot of meaning to that. So I, I would not view that as a negative thing at all. <laughs> I think that you, in, in my career, I never go home at the end of the day wondering if I made a difference. It, it is something that we get to do, to your point about meaning and value. It's it's all day, every day. Yeah. It, it's not getting stuck in the, you know, the mundane. And, and that is hard to be in it, in the difficult conversations, choices, death, symptom burden, new diagnoses, having to make all of this without knowing what someone would want or without knowing what you as the patient want. Um, but at the end of the day, the drive home is, it's not really sad. It's actually, wow, I really contributed to people's lives today. Yeah. I think the public perception is that what we do is sad. Don't you feel sad over the work? Sometimes the work is sad, but we don't sit in that loss and that suffering in the same way as the people who are experiencing it, mm -hmm. you know, the patient and their close loved ones, it's different for us. So as hospice people, yes, we, we have empathy and we do feel some of the suffering that our patients and families are going through, but we don't internalize it. It's not ours in the same way. It's, it's a little hard to describe unless you do this work, but yeah, we don't we don't carry the grief the same way. It's just different. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And then, you know, I would say that it actually empowers me when I get home, when I'm in a good space and taking care of myself. Because to your point, we do, you know, cross over from empathy to sympathy and, and get in the boat with them with their sadness sometimes. And sure. as providers, we have to recognize that and, and give ourselves whatever space, um, screaming, singing, driving, whatever we need to get back to the point where we can just be empathetic and, and not kind of jump into their boat of their life. But it also helps me go home at night and be a better mom and, and wife because life is short and you can not sweat the small stuff as much um, when you work in our field, I think. And, and so when we people talk about the sad, yeah, of course there are sad days, but I have a lot of fun at night because I see, you know, what life can be and, and how short it is. And it helps me to really capture life outside of work a little bit better. Yeah, it teaches us. So you're a hospice medical director. What does a typical day look like for you? I would say that there is no way to say a typical day is a typical. <laughs> a typical day is atypical. <laughs> so It's unpredictable, right? Yeah, exactly. In the hospice world, you have this space of we do our best to plan for things in advance and, you know, we have 
all of these decisions that are happening, but no matter how well you plan for things, crises occur every single day, every day and multiple times a day. And so as a hospice medical director, I'll say that the typical day is navigating the administrative stuff with the acute crises that are going on. And so it is very hard to be a hospice doctor and do it very well, I think, because you are making big decisions and big meetings and also signing prescriptions for the morphine concentrate that needs to be delivered in the next hour for your patient that's actively dying. And so um, I think a typical day for me is really uh, working towards balancing all the different hats. But usually it's a lot of administration. And I think that hospice physicians don't really understand that when they come into this field that they don't know about hospice care because as the providers and the leaders of the interdisciplinary group need to be making those higher level decisions about are patients appropriate for hospice care and you know what what are we doing with medications in this home that isn't a safe place to have opioids and there are a lot of these higher level decisions that are needing to be um, occurring all the time not to even start with all the documentation that's required so that's a normal day add in phone calls about admissions and symptoms and deaths and change of opinion maybe families have changed their mind and what does it look like when they want to come back into the healthcare system for aggressive care and um, so a typical day is balancing a lot of different hats for me the public perception and the public knowledge of what a hospice medical director does is pretty limited what they think you know it's one of those memes you know what your mother thinks you do what your patients think you do what you really do so they don't ever see the administrative side of things. What they see is the doctors writing the prescriptions, the doctors giving the orders. Maybe a doctor does a face-to-face visit. You know, a lot of times it's a nurse practitioner. But then on the administrative side of things, the doctor is actually certifying and writing this description of where the patient is, where they've come from the, with their disease trajectory and where it's anticipated that they'll be going. And everything hinges on that description. It's a physician narrative. And that's how you show that a patient qualifies for hospice. And all of that's on the physician to document. And there's a lot that goes into it. And it's not a one and done. You do one at the beginning, and then there are intervals where that has to be written and documented. And it takes collaboration because all the people on the team should be singing the same song. And all that information gets caught up in the narrative. So the physician's responsible for quite a bit of the administrative stuff on that side. But patients and families don't ever see that part of things. Yeah, absolutely. I I work in a hospice where we see a lot of our patients, our nurse practitioner, and our physicians do home visits, nursing home visits, inpatient level of care visits. And so it um, it's also adding in how can I carve out time to drive to someone's home and, and see them and then document appropriately. So that that's something that gets thrown into that typical day as well. But the administrative side, I will say when I started my career in hospice, I thought it was going to be all those late night amazing conversations where you <laughs> get people aligned with goals of care and everyone's happy that mom is comfortable and not on the machine that she never would have wanted. Yeah. How's, how's that working out for you? <laughs> Yeah, that's not how it goes. <laughs> so no. it is lovely. It happens. Um, but from a medical director perspective, you know, you unfortunately get pulled away from those good experiences because you are having to do more of this documentation burden, regulatory burden work, teaching, um, helping the whole team understand how to sing that same song and, and document in the record or what your expectations are for symptom management in general. Um, I think in the crisis that we're in, in the healthcare industry, we have such burden of um, having enough labor force and and the high turnaround um, of of nursing staff in particular for us in the the hospice field. And so teaching them about what hospice care looks like is another aspect to that medical director role that I love, though. I love to teach. Um, I love to talk about these good stories and and help them get out into the field so that they can get that uh, that experience. So what would be on your wish list? 
we know we know there's need for change, right? There are a lot of voices out there that are saying we need to change and we need to do better. What would be on your wish list for hospice care in the U.S.? My wish is so big. <laughs> My wish is that it can be pie in the sky, whatever you want. Okay. Everyone in the healthcare field have the emotional intelligence to be able to have hard conversations with people when it needs to happen. That's my wish. And it it has to do with uh, patients being accountable to compliant care if they're going to want, you know, the outcomes that they want. That's one thing. The second is, you know, being able to pause and have difficult conversations in times of crisis. But I think if we could all just learn to listen to each other and not react defensively, that with what we have now, which is so much room for change, we could do a lot better if we just paused and, and could actually you know, see where people are coming from with how they're making their choices, that, that we would deal with our current situation a lot better if we just had that emotional intelligence piece. That, that's my wish. I like it. That is a pretty big ask <laughs> for healthcare providers because we're not all good at that. No, and we're coming off of a space of shame and blame from the pandemic. The That's distrust right. um, is is unlike anything before, um, and so you're you're coming in having to defend yourself as being a good human being. We we've, we've not had to do that before. Right, And I mean, I'm I'm sure we have, but to the degree that it is now that you don't really have the benefit of the doubt in every space like we did before. And, and so I think our industry is just very, is reacting instead of stopping and listening to everyone's side and making the best decision. Yeah. There's always been a stigma and a lot of myths, misconceptions, misperceptions about what end of life care does. But yeah, since the pandemic, People just view healthcare people differently, I think, Mm -hmm. as a big group. So my last question is a little bit on the negative side, but I still want to explore this. What would you say your biggest personal challenge is when it comes to working inside end-of-life care? My biggest personal challenge, I think, is that I, it is hard to see a a good, what I think is a good, better, more peaceful path, and then watch a patient representative, typically not a patient representative, choose something that's other than that good path, especially when it's what I know that that patient wanted. I think personally, that's where I I really have to take a deep breath and check myself in in terms of um, what you're doing and honoring who we're trying to take care of. And so that personally, I have a really hard time with watching those decisions be made based off of whatever, wherever they're coming from, their own grief, their own guilt, their past traumas, the um, not ready to lose their loved one, all types of valid reasons. But personally, I really, really have a hard time when our patients aren't served with what their goal it, it's hard. It's hard to be in the space with them um, as they walk their hospice journey and, and want them to have a peaceful, comfortable death and not get there. It's really hard. Yeah. Yeah. We are not their decision makers. And sometimes it's really hard to watch. Mm-hmm. Okay, Lauren. So this will be our last question. We'll raise this up a little bit. What's your current go-to healthy self-care habit? Oh, I just got a dog. And so walking my dog has been the best thing ever. And and so I really identified the difference in exercise and, and healthy movement for me. I turned 40 this year. And so I'm all about the like, I don't want osteoporosis and all those things that you <laughs> right, could forget right. 40, about. 40 makes you think, doesn't it? <laughs> it does make you think. It makes you think. But I redefined what my relationship with movement is. And so it's not 30 minutes in the gym and being hard uh, on me with this crucial or, you know, just just kind of destructive workout, which may be great for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. For me, movement is the best thing for me to process re-engaging with my family and leaving the hospital stuff behind. 
um, and the best thing to help me kind of be in a good mental space. So walking my dog has been the best thing ever. And the accountability of having a puppy, she's kind of a puppy that needs exercise. I mean, I just picked up some shoes that were chewed to, <laughs> I haven't, and I didn't walk the dog this morning. And so it's like, wow, yeah, I didn't take care of me and I didn't take care of her. So this is what we get. Yeah. But the simplicity of it, it's just easy to get out in nature and walk. Um, it, you know, that's available to anybody at any point. Walk outside as long as you can be safe. And I, that is my new number one thing for self-care is just moving my body outside of nature. And it, it comes with a dog these days. I love it. I love it. Thanks for spending time talking with me today. It's wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I've enjoyed watching you guys grow over years and and listening to what you have to offer. And I just love anybody who's speaking about hospice in a real manner um, and talking about the good that we provide to the healthcare system and, and the people that we serve. It's just, it's amazing. So you can tell she has such a blend of the heart and the science. She knows the evidence-based stuff. She also knows how important empathy is. A great interview. Now you've got a little snapshot look into what the life of a hospice medical director is like. Be sure to catch the next episode of the Heart of Hospice podcast. You can find more episodes on theheartofhospice.com. Don't forget to follow us on your favorite podcast platform. You can connect with the Heart of Hospice on Facebook and Instagram and send your questions or comments by email to helen at theheartofhospice.com. And remember, no matter who you are or where you are in your hospice journey, you are the heart of hospice. This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time.